Hello, class, and back again with module three. So without further ado, let me go ahead and share that screen. <clears throat> I realize that I'm a broken record and say the same thing on the very first bit there. Ah, ha, ha. Okay. We're going to talk about module three today, public health and prevention approaches. So um, module three is going to have two objectives in this first video and then one objective in the last video. So only three objectives for this. If you haven't figured it out already, objectives are your study guide. If you know that stuff, then um, you you will definitely do well on the quiz, the video quiz. All right. Well, let's get into our objectives. Speaking of... Describing public health and public health surveillance programs. I know you've probably heard about public health, but what is it? Explaining the age of onset effects for substance abuse, and then critically review the gateway hypothesis. And we'll talk a little bit about ooh, gateway drugs. Oh, scary. And then finally, describe and evaluate schools and community-based interventions to see how those are working. Okay, objective one, we're going to describe public health and public health surveillance programs. All right, public health. What's the definition and what's the philosophy of public health? We're going to cover that a little bit. Public health is a study of lifestyles and living conditions that determine health, and then Consequently, planning and investing in policies and programs and services which create, maintain, and protect health in populations, in communities. So let me give you an example of a public health initiative. Um, the Many, many campuses, including the University of Missouri, have a smoke-free campus. That's a public health initiative. You're not treating people who are nicotine users. Instead, you're preventing nicotine. You're reducing nicotine use by not allowing it on campus. And of course, many, many, many places started doing this in the uh, you know early 2000s. And that did, in fact, cut down on nicotine use quite a bit. Those were public health initiatives. Okay, so let's talk about the scope of public health. Um, there are three core areas of public health. One is protection of people, right? So these are things like healthy workplaces, workplaces where people are not gonna get injured or be exposed to toxic chemicals, um, environmental hazards, uh, clean drinking water, clean air, um, cl you know, food, but being able to inspect food and make sure that it's not going to cause diseases. So we do that, um, for example, with the Food and Drug Administration. Okay, so that's protection. Promotion, promoting healthy behaviors. So, um, for example, promoting exercise, promoting healthy diet, right? The food pyramid, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, improving the social determinants of health. And we'll talk a little bit more about the social determinants of health, um, but those are things like poverty, uh, poor education, uh, not having access to healthy uh, uh, environments, healthy foods and things like that. Uh, and then finally, prevention. And that's things like managing health emergencies. So, uh, so public health is involved in all kinds of infectious disease emergencies like COVID-19. How do you keep uh, that, that virus from spreading? Uh, screening. So children being screened for, let's say, for autism or for other kinds of disorders. Um, so to, to make sure that you get early and appropriate treatment. And then finally, vaccinations are a really good example of, of prevention. So we're preventing disease by providing, researching, developing, providing vaccination. So that's the kind of things that public health does. Okay, so I want to just distinguish now public health from medicine and talk a little bit about the kind of philosophy that each one uses. So public health, as I described, they're there to promote, protect, and, and, and prevent um, disease states. Uh, for who? For populations, for whole communities, right? So we're not really looking at treating individual people. 
And because we're looking at a community-wide basis or population-wide basis, we talk about the philosophy being collectivistic or collectivism. We're not treating individuals. Instead, we're, say, for example, preventing substance abuse or reducing substance abuse in whole populations by essentially making communities healthier. Uh, medicine is very different because me medicine is uh, reactive to a, a large extent. So you're treating and you're caring for, and to a certain extent, you're preventing um, uh, uh, illnesses, but you're doing it in individuals, in individual people. So you go into the doctor and you get treatment. And the philosophy there is individualism. Each each person, is, you know, who has a, a substance abuse or substance use issue is uh is is the one who you would treat as opposed to treating the community okay so let's talk about the history of public health a little bit um in the 1700s and uh, through the late 1800s um basically public health was a sort of reactionary um, idea. So they reacted to some public uh, health problems. For example, there was an infectious disease that went around during that time, which was devastating, killed a lot of people called smallpox. And, and though they didn't really understand how smallpox was spread from person to person to person, uh, public health officials started to recognize that with once smallpox was really, really bad, that overcrowding seemed to be associated with the problem. Now, remember, this is prior to this idea that microorganisms cause disease. That's germ theory. We'll get to that later. They didn't realize that people were passing it to one another. They weren't sure exactly why, but they did notice that overcrowded conditions were ones that really spread smallpox. In the 1800s, um, public health went through a period that they called the sanitary movement. And that was uh, based on this idea called the miasma principle. And this came prior to the uh, germ theory, but it was similar to germ theory, but they didn't really know that much about it. So basically the miasma pr principle was that th there were these sort of invisible clouds of toxic matter, for example, like smallpox was caused by these kind of invisible clouds that would swirl around and that would actually you know, get in a person and cause a disease. And the clouds, I know you're thinking, oh, well, that's coming out of people's exhale. No, they didn't think about that. They just said, there are these invisible clouds. They don't know where they're from. And they just could hit you at any time. Anyway, they really didn't know about the idea of germs or microorganisms or bacteria that might cause disease. So at any rate, but this was an improvement because what they started doing is improving garbage disposal because they thought that, you know, miasma could could uh, gather around garbage and things like that. They did reduce overcrowding. And so that was good. But it wasn't until the 1900s that public health made some huge advancements in terms of infectious disease. They found basically germ theory. And germ theory um, was, was uh, largely promoted by one particular physician named John Snow, and he was working on cholera. And what he found was that cholera epidemics seemed to center around particular areas of cities. So a cholera ep epidemic may ha would happen, for example, close to a water plant. And he would map this out. And in fact, people were more concentrated, more likely to get cholera, right, who, who were being served from this particular water pump. And so he isolated that to, uh, to be able to look at the water. And he found in there that there were microorganisms that, in fact, were causing cholera. Um, well, it was a hard road to battle, and that's an interesting history on, in and of itself that I won't describe. But he eventually convinced people that, in fact, it well, cholera was caused by germs that were in the water. Well, that was huge, because that said, oh, well, we got to watch 
food standards. We got to watch water standards. We need to make sure that this stuff doesn't have those microorganisms. We found vaccines that could combat those microorganisms when they get to the body, make the person's body ready for them so they could fight them. Um, there was health education about um, boiling water and things like that. Um, to make sure that you kill the microorganisms. So that was huge. And that took care of a lot of infectious disease and cut down on cholera quite a bit. But what, but more than anything, if you if you had to put together this whole history and why it matters, is that that public health was one area that really said, hey, environmental factors are huge. Living conditions are huge. It's not just a disease in one person, which is this medical idea, but in fact, it has to do with a whole community that either, uh, either thwarts or encourages in some ways substance abuse or substance use in our case. Um, of course, they deal with a lot of other things in public health too. But improving living conditions is super, super important. Okay, so public health today, there's a massive government investment. For example, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, is, is, is a public health organization. And we're going to see some data from SAMHSA a little bit later. Um, they, it, public health has been professionalized. So there's now training in public health. And so, for example, you can get a master's degree in public health. Um, and if you're interested in this area, fascinating. Um, that may be some area that you want to go in life. It's about improving communities to make them healthier. I love it. Anyway, um, it now there's a broadened scope. It's like, how can we deal with substance use in communities? How can we deal with obesity in communities that seems to affect certain communities more than others? How can we deal with violence in communities? And what are ways in which we can change things around with living conditions to make that situation for better for people and healthier for people? Okay, so let's look. Because since 1900, and that wasn't that long ago, you know, um, the average lifespan in the United States has gone up by about 30 years. What does that mean? That means people used to die at like age 50. That was average. Well, I'm 56 years old. I mean, they would be, I would be dead, right? If I lived back prior to 1900. Well, what happened? Public health happened. That's what happened. And it improved situations so much that we, uh, with that, that our lifespan Im increased quite a bit. So public health has not been insubstantial. A lot of times we think about that increase in lifespan, which you already knew about, of course, um, to be due to medical technology or medical advances. But in fact, the, the, there's an estimate out there. There's some research that did some modeling estimates. that said about 25 years of this increase, 25 years years out of 30 is due to public health efforts. So let's look at what those are. Here's, here's some of the great public health achievements in the United States. Vaccines, whoa, that's huge, right? How many more people would have died of COVID-19 had we not been able to develop a vaccine there? Prevention and control of infectious diseases. When they start being able to contain them, being able to prevent people from getting them in the first place. Tobacco control, I mean, basically tobacco was killing tons and tons of people. And being able to control that or reduce tobacco use, that's huge. Maternal and infant health. Many, many people died of infant mortality. Um, there we had a huge infant mortality, which has gone down quite a bit. Of course, there are hint, because I'm gonna talk about this in the future, there are massive health disparities in infant mortality. And if you are a black woman, your the, the possibility, the risk of infant mortality is far, far greater than if you're white. If you are poor, it is far, far greater than if you are rich. We'll talk about those issues a little bit later. Uh, motor vehicle safety, that's been huge. I mean, imagine what it was like not to have seatbelts, not to have headrests, not to have airbags, all that's public health. 
cardiovascular disease prevention, okay? So these are things like keeping um, tabs on blood pressure and things like that. Occupational safety, safety, I mean, some of you might've read the jungle, right? What it was like to work in uh, meat packing plants uh, during the era of industrialization. It was just awful, people died all the time. Cancer prevention, the list goes on and on. These are just 10 great achievements of public health, but public health has added many, many years to our life. So let's look at this triad model of causation of public health. We, uh, the public health uses a triad to talk about what causes health problems. So first off, we have, and we're going to talk about this in terms of drugs, but the, but the triad uh, model of causation refers to any disease. Okay, so first we have an individual. That's what we call the host. Okay, so we've talked about some about the individual, um, you know, of, of a certain age. In the case of drug use and and especially illicit drug use, we're talking about younger ages, uh, favorable attitudes toward drug use, susceptibility of peer, possible genetic susceptibility, which may be behind a lot of this stuff, um, prenatal drug use, uh, dual diagnosis, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, having a, another mental health problem, brain changes, things like that. Things that are going on in the individual. But then you've got to also have an agent. The drug has to be there. You can have all this stuff with the individual, but if, if, if there are no drugs available, then you're not going to have it. So the agent is the drug itself. For example, availability of alcohol, availability of nicotine. Let's take nicotine, for example. Nicotine comes in many, many different ways, and we see that with marijuana as well. You can buy it in many, many different ways. The manufacturer of the drug uh, has led to massive availability, right? Uh, it, you can get it pretty much everywhere, all around, uh, any city. Um, it, 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 it is prepared in lots of different types of preparations. So for example, with the, in the case of, uh, of nicotine, once we started getting vaping, that increased nicotine use. Well, surprise, surprise, it didn't really have to do with people or the genetic susceptibility. It, it had to do with the agent there. So the potential for increasing through the use of vaping. Uh, same thing happened with marijuana. We got, you know, it used to be people just would smoke marijuana, rarely ate marijuana. Now people are eating edibles all the time. There's vaping, there are drinks, there are thousands of ways to take marijuana. I'm sure you know about it. Uh, the strength of the drug. Now marijuana preparations are quite a bit stronger than they were, for example, um, in, you know, the 70s, uh, 80s and prior to that. Um, far more THC. Okay, so what's then the environment? So all these three things have to happen and they're all a part of substance use. So the environment, cultural norms and standards. What is it like? What, what's it like in your family, for example? In my family growing up, alcohol was perfectly fine. It was not seen as a problem. Even actually pretty heavy drinking was not seen as a problem. Do your friends use drugs and alcohol? Um, it, do you have a family history? Do you have, what, what's your family functioning like? It, are, are you living in a, a poor area, in a lower income area? Are you living in a higher income area? Are you living in an area in which people are selling drugs on the streets? And there's a, a, a lot of availability of drugs. I notice that in poor areas of the city is where marijuana dispensaries are generally set up, right? And uh, and where there are many, many convenience stores that sell tobacco products and alcohol. So lack of employment opportunities, lack of community involvement, all, all of this matters. So we can't just look at the individual in a public health approach. We're looking at all of this stuff because we can make changes at any one of those points. Okay, health disparities. Minority and low income groups have worse health outcomes in the United States. Uh, we see the differences in asthma, binge drinking, diabetes, HIV, as I mentioned, maternal health, uh, infant mortality, colorectal cancer, heart disease, the list is tremendous, literally tremendous. And what it comes down to is that people who have less income, wealth, living in poverty situations are less likely to be healthy in the United States. And part of the problem there is that we are a capitalist society. Capitalist, you, know, you may be all, all about capitalism for some things, but one cannot say that capitalism is a good driver of health 
equity. It is a good driver generally of health disparities. So when we see differences, vast differences in wealth equity, in wealth, when we're talking about inequality in wealth, we are talking about inequality in health. So that is a huge problem. Let's look at what happens there. Okay, so um, here are some of the areas in, in which we, we are talking about social and economic inequities. This is what happens essentially if you are, uh, these are the, the areas that are gonna impact your health if you are poor versus rich. So look at the bottom here and you can see mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, functional limitations. This is your health and well-being. This is all the stuff that supports it. I mean, if you have decent employment in the United States, you're gonna have decent insurance, right? Uh, your income, your expenses, your debt, your medical bills, your support, all of that affects your housing, your playgrounds, the walkability, whether you can exercise, where are you living? You know, some places it's not safe to go out, right? And so people are kind of confined to their homes. In other places, it's quite safe and you can run out to the park community center on all kinds of wonderful walking and biking trails. Education, do you have access to education? Is there high, do you have the ability to do higher education? Vocational training. Food, just having healthy foods around, community safety. You get the idea here. If you're poor, in many ways, you're screwed health-wise. Not even, let's talk about the healthcare system. I mean, come on, we've got a healthcare system that is dependent on full-time employment. I mean, enough said. Lots of Americans live on junk food. A surprise, surprise, right? So this is, as you see the darker colors in this map, these are a greater percentage of the population that have no car and no supermarket within a mile of where they live. Well, look at the concentration there. It's in the South. Are you surprised that we see uh, many, many, many poor health indicators in the South compared to other areas of the United States. So this is just one example is the, the food desert. If you're poor, you just simply don't have many uh, healthy options. And, and those of you who have eaten lunch at a gas station know what's available there. And I'm sure you all have, as have I. <laughs> okay. Public health surveillance. Well, one of the big important things that public health does in the United States and elsewhere is ongoing data collection and interpretation. They surveil what's happening in the United States. And that's gonna provide that empirical data on the current state of alcohol and drug use. It's gonna inform priorities, policies, and programs. So I'm gonna go through some examples of some findings um, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in, in 2021. What they did is they went and did face-to-face -face interviews about 70,000. And this is with a representative sample of the population in the United States. They do it every year. It's wonderful. Um, it gives us a ton of data about what's currently going on. They also use some computer assisted interviews where they hand over the laptop to the person and they answer some stuff themselves because there may be some things that people wouldn't want to tell an interviewer. Okay, so let's look at some of the um, findings there. Past use, uh, past year substance use disorder. Um, if you look at a substance use disorder in the past year, we see uh, alcohol use disorder is far more common than even all of the drug use uh, disorders combined. Uh, if you look at the illicit uh, uh, drugs, or at least the other drugs, um, you see that marijuana use disorder is actually quite high. Um, amphetamine, stimulants, cocaine, heroin are relatively low compared to the others. This doesn't mean it's not a huge problem. People don't generally die from marijuana use disorder, but they do die many times from cocaine and heroin stimulant use disorder. Um, so we do we do see uh, some of those are, are kind of more severe, and you know that because of the opioid epidemic currently. But this is just to show you that alcohol use disorder is definitely number one. Um, that said, 
about only about 16.5% of people will have had substance use disorder uh, in the last year. On the other hand, <laughs> that's like a lot of people, right? It's like almost one out of every five people. Okay, so let's look at um, the alcohol use in a little bit more detail that this survey is able to show. Um, and there's much, much more data from the survey that I'm not going to show. I'm just giving you a little sample. So um, there are many, many alcohol users in the United States. That doesn't mean that they have a problem per se. Um, we pay special attention to binge alcohol use because that's a little bit more dangerous health-wise. Um, binge alcohol use means that in the past month, if you're a man, you have drank over five drinks, five or more drinks in one sitting. And if you are a woman, you drank four or more in one sitting, that would be a binge. And then within that area of binge, um, and, it, and it's about 12% of all alcohol users will be heavy users. Those users are binging five or more times a month. Okay, so binging once a month would be a binge alcohol user. If you're binging more than five, five or more times a month, then you would be a heavy alcohol user, which means you binge often. Hopefully that's clear. Okay, let's take a look at uh, uh, substance use disorders by age. So if we look at these age categories, what we see is that, and I just want to draw your attention to marijuana there. Uh, marijuana is a very, um, uh, you've, got, you've got an age thing going on there. And you can see that from 18 to 25 is the highest marijuana use uh, uh, disorder going on there. Now that's interesting because we're going to talk a little bit later about maturing out. Now we don't know that in fact if you get older you'll start using less marijuana uh, because this may be a cohort effect where just older people just tended to use less because it wasn't as popular when they were growing up. But this group may continue to use more as they get older, but that's quite a vast difference and we don't see that so much with some of the other um, drugs there, at least the ones that are pictured there. Okay, um, this is illicit um, drug use. So they say illicit because marijuana is still I illegal and prescription pain relievers if you're not, if it is not a prescription written to you at that time is also considered to be illicit. Um, marijuana being federally illegal, still we consider it to be illicit although the federal government has kind of doesn't pay attention to states like Missouri too much where they have legalized it. And probably things are gonna change with the federal government on that as well. Okay, most people, 78.1% of people don't, haven't had any illicit drug use in the last year, but about 20%, 21%, that's over one in five people are going to have used in the last year. But look, for the most part, um, they are using marijuana and the use of these others are very, very low by comparison. So let's take a look at past year opioid use. So opioids are, um, are, are pain relievers, a whole spate of which are prescribed, right? Like hydrocodone, Oxycontin, and then some are traditionally sold on the street. And those are things like heroin, for example. Uh, so if we look at the number of people here, so uh, who are using uh, uh, pain, pain relievers, prescription pain relievers, but again, they're misusing it, um, meaning that they're using it uh, in a different way than was prescribed. Okay, so here we have those prescription pain relievers, and then here we have heroin. You can see that from these data that really um, heroin use is relatively small compared to the large amount of people that are use, misusing uh, pain relievers. So let's take a look at, at those people in a little bit more detail. How are people getting, who, those who misuse the pain relievers, how are they getting the pain relievers. Well, look at this. They got it through prescriptions or stole it from a healthcare provider. A lot, a lot. And, you know, sometimes 
That is a, a prescription from one doctor where the doctor is prescribing it like crazy. And so it's leading to a misuse situation. Uh, prescriptions from more than one doctor, people go doctor shopping, they could steal from a doctor's office. Or, I mean, it's like a lot are getting it through doctor. About an equal amount are getting it from other people. But for the most part, very, very few people are buying from a drug dealer or other stranger, what somebody that they don't know. They might get it from a family member, you know, somebody had a problem and they had some, you know, oxycodone on them and they didn't take it all. And so now they give it away uh, or, or even sell it to somebody else. Okay, so I'm sure you can start to see where policy might come in here, right? How can we change things around a little bit in communities? How do we know what things to work on? We can do that through these surveillance data. You know, if we can deal with one of these pieces, that's huge. Even things like expanding the ability to get rid of drugs that are in your medicine cabinet that you don't use anymore. What if we had more drug disposal sites, safe drug disposal sites, and in fact, increase the promotion of them and said, here, drop off your drugs here. It's healthier for your community. It's healthier for everyone. And just made it available. Well, when's the last time? Do you know where to drop off drugs? No, a lot of people flush them down the toilet. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, well, you can probably drop them off at a pharmacy at any rate. Objective two, um, we are going to explain the age of onset effects and critically review the gateway hypothesis. So let's take a look first at age of onset. One of the most effective ways to reduce substance use disorders is just get not, it's just keeping people from doing drugs for another year. If they're going to start doing, if, if they're going to smoke marijuana for the first time at age 15, they're more likely to, to end up with a marijuana use disorder than if they started at age 16. And if they started at age 17, even better. And if they started at 18, even better. And if they started at 19, even better. So one big thing that we can do in public health is just keep people from starting. Keep people from starting until later. And thus the reasons why, for example, you can't buy marijuana legally, recreationally until you're 21. You can't buy alcohol legally, recreationally until you are 21. That makes sense. I'm not sure what it is for, for tobacco right now. I think 18. Maybe it's 21. I think it's 21, actually, in a lot of communities. So research supports this. Early onset, as I mentioned, is going to predict those substance use disorders uh, later on in life. And for every single year we can postpone it, it's going to knock that down substantially. In fact, with it, the data on alcohol says it knocks it down by 14%. That's huge. Being drunk for the first time before or at age 15 is associated with elevated mortality rates. That's if we can keep people off alcohol until beyond 15, we can cut their death rates. Adolescent smoking is related to tons of risky behaviors. And I'm talking about smoke, I'm talking about nicotine, violence, unprotected sex, other substance use. So, you know, the, the, even just keeping people off of nicotine in, in, the, in the case even of vaping nicotine. So as I mentioned, it, it, the data on alcohol use disorder, every single year you can knock down the probability of alcohol use disorder by 14% if you just keep people from drinking alcohol for one more year. Well, what's the gateway hypothesis? The gateway hypothesis is this concept that if you drink beer or wine, if you start doing that, that's going to lead to hard liquor and cigarettes or or um, or nicotine. And then that's going to lead to cannabis or marijuana. And then that's going to lead to other hard drugs like cocaine, right? And heroin. This is the idea that, you know, nicotine is a gateway drug or marijuana is a gateway drug. And many, many people believe this idea. So for example, of those people who are, um, who are, who support keeping marijuana illegal, 
Look at the second biggest reason why they say they want marijuana to be illegal. It's because it would lead more people to use stronger and more addictive drugs. So that is a popular notion that some drugs are gateway drugs to other drugs. So though it is not without controversy, there's evidence for it, but there's also evidence against it. So almost all hard drug users, if you are a cocaine user, if you are a heroin user, you most likely used prior to that marijuana and you most likely used prior to that nicotine and alcohol. Okay, so you say, oh, well, that must have been the gateway, right? But does it actually mean that's a gateway? We've got to look at some other things. So if you look at alcohol and nicotine users, the vast majority do not go on to use marijuana and other harder drugs. So there it's starting to fall apart, right? And the question really on this is, is it causal? If you use marijuana, does that cause you to use harder drugs? Or if you use nicotine, does that cause you then to use marijuana? And the, the issue is a big one because we don't know the answer to it because we don't have good experimental studies, which would be unethical to do because you'd have to give people drugs and not give people drugs. Instead, we just study people who have already who are already doing all these drugs. And the problem is it could be another variable in there. For example, um, people in poverty are more likely to use all of these drugs, right? People who are impulsive are more likely to use all of these drugs. People with lots of access are more likely to use all of these drugs. So it may not be that one drug is causing the use of another drug, but that something else is causing the use of drugs in general. And that's why we see a person who uses hard drugs has used every other drug because they had lots of access to drugs, for example, or they weren't supervised well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, a, that is somewhat controversial. So I want you to be able to understand the controversy behind that. We really don't know. It needs to be studied more. Okay, next time we will talk about um, school and community-based interventions. But until then, I'm signing off. Hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope you do well on that quiz. Have a great day.